Welcome to K Talk. Continue our Black Letter series. This is lesson number nine. I am Dan O'Gorman, Associate Professor at Barry University School of Law. And I'm Steve Maxwell, Director of Academic Achievement and Lecturer in Law at the University of Miami School of Law. And in this lesson, we are going to talk about consideration. This is going to be a two part project to talk about consideration. Hard to do it all in one episode. In this portion, we are going to talk about bargain for exchange. In the next episode, we'll talk about the requirement that that which is exchanged has legal value, whatever that means. Stay tuned. But bargain for exchange, Steve, I think students struggle with consideration. We just finished doing option contracts. Another topic they struggle with and I can tell you it's around this time in the semester that they decide I am not as nice a guy as they thought I was. That sounds like a, a point for consideration. We should consider this, considering <laughs> it, there's a lot of points of consideration. Uh, do you find that students struggle with the concept of consideration? Well, in my context, I deal with them really vis-a-vis -vis the bar. And I think the whole idea of consideration as is tested on the bar exam is rather simplistic and much more basic than your first year contract professor is probably expecting of you. Uh, and I think it's interesting because I think that's one of the things that trips them up when they come to bar prep is that they've gotten so nuanced and so detailed. If you're lucky in their first year, if you're lucky, but a lot of them, a lot of them still struggle to get to that nuance, but then those that do then struggle to, to see it for what it is in 99% of the cases where consideration really isn't an issue because it's bargain for exchange at the end of the day, this for that. It's not that complicated, but when you get to drawing these fine line distinctions, it can get complicated very quickly. You know, there is criticism of professors that we contract professors spend a lot more time on the doctrine of consideration than it is worthy of when you look at its importance or lack thereof in the real world. Uh, and you've, you've also pointed out the bar exam, perhaps its importance starts decreasing compared to the way we as contract professors treat it. I think that you know, one of the problems is that when you practice law, a lot of the stuff that you'd be doing in contracts disputes tend to be things like interpreting the contract. What does it mean? There's ambiguities in the contract. And you can only spend so much time on that, you know, two months on a contract interpretation doesn't really seem like a great way to spend your time. And so we do so we do cover certain things that in the real world and then also perhaps on the bar are not as important as the amount of time we devote to it. But I will say this, per, uh, lawyers of course are brought in on contract issues when there is a mess. And a lot of times if there's a mess and you're looking for a way to avoid the problem, you might have a chance at arguing, hey, there's no consideration here, I can tell you that I get questions from former students, from attorneys on consideration issues when they're practicing. And what's interesting about it is typically, you know, it's sort of like, well, wait a second, can I avoid, can my client avoid this claim by somehow arguing there wasn't any consideration for it? So it's nice later in practice, even though it doesn't come up a lot, it's sure nice to maybe bring it out and say, hey, let me open, let me, let me take off the shelf this dusty old friend that I haven't thought much about since law school, crack it open, you know, sneeze a bit because the dust is flying and see if maybe I can find a hidden gem in here. Uh, of course, that hidden gem is designed to crush the other side, but you know, you get the point. So uh, <laughs> with that said, for law students, of course, it tends to be a pretty important issue because law professors give it a lot of importance. And we're going to talk about bargain for exchange. That is really the heart of consideration is that there is a bargain for exchange. We talked about how you have to have an offer and how you have to have an acceptance. 
I have a lot of students who will tell me, Professor, if there's an offer and there's an acceptance, there's necessarily consideration because the acceptance is the consideration you accept by supplying the consideration. I would not follow that. In some respects, it might make a lot of sense, but I think if you are not doing a separate analysis after you do offer an acceptance with consideration, you might end up running into trouble as a law student on a law school exam, you should keep it as a separate analysis. And remember, Steve, we talked about offer. Your statement defines offer one of the elements as a manifestation of willingness to enter into a bargain, inviting students, almost tempting them to do a consideration analysis embedded with offer. I also think that's a little bit dangerous because then when you get to this part, element three, you may not have much left to do and you might simply be repeating yourself. So I encourage students, don't say if you've got an acceptance, you necessarily have consideration. Don't do a big analysis of consideration and offer. Save it as a separate third element. Otherwise, you got nothing, you know, there's nothing to this movie when you hit yeah. that number three. I will second that in a powerful way because I, I think a lot of times you know, students are thrown off by the fact that the, the entire deal resides within the offer. You know, the, the offer does a lot of work. And so it is tempting because you see the consideration embedded within the offer. And it is so tempting when you see it that way, you just want to say something. But I completely agree. You evaluate that offer as your definition of an offer. And you ignore the presence or absence of consideration until you get to that as a definition. That, that's, that's what I recommend. And, and you're absolutely right. It is within offers embedded a lot of stuff. Like, is it an offer for a unilateral bilateral contract? Well, that's not really an issue of offer. It's, it is sort of because you got to look at the offer to figure out how you accept because the master of the offer doctrine but it's really an acceptance issue. Do I accept with a return promise or do I accept with a performance? Yes, we figure that out by looking at the offer, but it's really an acceptance issue. So a lot of doing well, I think, on analysis is having these clean lines. Okay, so the way I like to think of it is if you have an offer and you have an acceptance, we have an agreement. We don't know what kind of agreement at this point. It just means we have an agreement. Both parties have assented to something. The question is, what is it that they've assented to? And consideration is this requirement that there is assent to a bargain for exchange, a bargain. Remember how we talked about the difference between offer and acceptance, I'm sorry, between contract and promissory estoppel and quasi-contract? We talked about promissory estoppel is focusing on bargain for exchange. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, promissory estoppel on detrimental reliance. And we focused on contract as being about a bargain. So that's what consideration is going to do, is going to identify that there is this bargain for exchange as part of the agreement. And I like to break it down even more. I like to break it down between bargain for and exchange. Exchange is this requirement that each side give up a promise or a performance as part of the exchange. It's going to be at least one promise because a contract has at least one promise, but it's either going to be a promise for a promise, bilateral contract, or it is going to be a promise given in exchange for a performance, unilateral contract. But each party has to give up either a promise or a performance. If there's just one promise, and there's no promise on the other side and no performance, it can't be a contract because you don't have an exchange. So let's talk about some of the issues that come up in deciding whether or not you have a bargain for exchange. And I'll kind of identify whether I view this as, is there an exchange? Or do I view it as, is there a bargain for exchange? Okay, the idea of past considerations. Steve, I like to start with the concept of exchange first. Make sure that students understand that you've got to be swapping exchange, you got to be swapping promise for another promise or a performance. This idea of a quid pro quo, this for that. 
past consideration. This is tricky, though I don't think students struggle this much with this. That's a terrible name for it, Steve. Is it past, consider past consideration is a horrible name for this. Yeah, it, I agree. It, it, it almost just reading the word seems like the opposite of bargain for. It, because it, it can't be bargained for if it's past. And you know what? I, but let me tell you, you know what? I got a problem with the name is it says it's past consideration. But past, <laughs> past consideration <laughs> is not consideration. Yeah, it's like, it's almost like ATM machine, you know, like where you say, okay. Movable I'll, goods. Machine, machine. Right, exactly. Movable goods. Movable things right. that are movable. Right. Past, consider, past consideration is not consideration. So I'm not, it really should be past something else. <laughs> it's not consideration. So the idea, past performance or past promise. Or past benefit, exactly. Yeah. Something like that. So right off the bat, please, students, do not be confused by the fact that this doctrine is called the past consideration doctrine. Don't be lulled into believing that past consideration means there's consideration, it's gonna be the exact opposite. We call it past consideration, but it is in fact not consideration. Past consideration arises when a person makes a promise. And remember what we're looking for with a contract is we're looking to see if the promisor gave their promise in exchange for another promise or a performance. Past consideration is the situation when the promisor gives a promise, but they are not giving their promise in exchange for a current reciprocal promise or for a future performance. They are giving their promise in recognition of a benefit provided by the promisee in the past. So the timing is all wrong. So Steve, you know, I don't know, you know, so remember, you know, that time that you found me on, you know, wandering in the streets, bleeding, disoriented. That's how we met actually, isn't it? Yeah, I think that was one L year, wasn't it? Yes, that was. <laughs> that's right. All right. Oh, that's what right. That well, that, that was the students. Or was that me? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, I was a little right. professor. I was just so confused. Yeah, it just sounds like the one L experience, right? Disoriented, wandering the streets. Right. As a student, I, I, I right. thought you were suggesting that was my performance <laughs> as a first year professor. So you and you and and, and you you took me in and you, mm -hmm. you nursed me back to health. And I was so thankful, Steve, that you did that. I, of course, being the mensch that I am, I said, Steve, thank you. And I promised you $1,000 for your good deeds. And then, of course, I never paid. And you sued me for breach, breach of my promise. There's no doubt I made a promise. Uh, there was evidence of it. Let's say I put it in writing. There was no doubt I had breached. But the problem was there was no consideration for that promise. Because remember, in order to have consideration, you must have a bargain for exchange. To have a bargain for exchange, you must have an exchange. And to have an exchange, that promise must have been given in exchange for another promise or a performance. Now you might say, but wait a second, that promise was given in exchange for a performance, you nursing me back to health. But the problem is the timing is off. An exchange is not something where you do X and then after that, the other party in recognition of it promises Y. The promise must induce the return promise or the performance. And here the timing is all wrong. It came afterwards. So the promise could not have induced your performance because your performance happened first, then the promise. This is what we call past consideration and it is not consideration. And therefore my promise to you, even though made, is not part of a contract and is at least not legally binding as a contract. And there was an exchange, at least an exchange contemplated 
but there was no bargaining for that exchange. You know, if I took Dan in and he's stumbling, confused and bleeding just because I wanted to, and then he promises there's no consideration because there's no bargained for exchange. And I like the words are so, so important. The way we could change that is if, if I found Dan confused, tired, hungry, bleeding, roaming the streets, and, and he says, please help me. And I say, give me a thousand dollars and I'll help you. And that is a bargain for exchange where there's no bargaining for it, there's no consideration, even if there seems to be an exchange. So Steve, what's, what's, what's the takeaway from this? Because I find it mildly troubling. <laughs> because jerks get rewarded under this doctrine. <laughs> <laughs> look, contract law has no problem with good Samaritans. I look, I, it's just not our thing. <laughs> right, I mean, for the most part, I mean, we're not anti-good Samaritans. It's just like, look, we can't do it all. We're here to deal with contracts, right? We don't, we don't do, we're not in the, we're not in the good Samaritan business. You know, that's something, some other area of law, I assume, right? Well, probably not much, right? right. You're probably going to be looking and not find a home anywhere, perhaps for the most part, but hey, that is not what we do. So that's absolutely <laughs> right. If, if you had promised, if you had made an offer before you had uh, helped me, now it's a different story. And note that if you can, so let's talk about alternative ways that maybe we could get you some money, that you had been the nice guy, you've been the good Samaritan, ways that maybe we can get you some money for the good Samaritan. Well, remember, we're only talking about whether or not a promise here becomes what we call a contractual promise, meaning a promise that is part of a contract and therefore legally binding because it's in a contract. That's only one way. Don't forget there's alternative ways to potentially get a recovery. Now, these aren't great ways. If, 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 you don't, if you're trying to force a promise as not part of a contract, you're not in a good place, which don't give up quite yet. So for example, see, let's say after I promise you this money, you then go out and buy a motorcycle for $1,000 because you're counting on the money and then I don't pay you even though that promise was not at first legally binding as part of a bargain for exchange because the timing was all wrong, the fact that it has induced you to detrimentally rely on it might enable you to turn that promise into a legally binding one through the doctrine of promissory estoppel, which as you may recall is this alternative when there is no consideration for promise, but it has induced detrimental reliance the promisee can try to win on promissory estoppel if they can get all of the elements of it. Uh, so at least you've got a shot there at getting a recovery. But if you had never detrimentally relied, you're not going to be able to recover on promissory estoppel. Uh, and a lot of students listening to this uh, will have uh, probably will have read Feinberg, probably principally because everyone listening to this is at this point probably my student, and so hopefully they've read it, uh, uh, Feinberg, which was his case, where, as you may remember, she, uh, this was a woman who was promised a pension, uh, that if, when she retired, she'd get a pension, but she did not have to continue working. Uh, it was, there was no quid pro quo. It wasn't like, we'll give you a pension if you keep working. She could quit tomorrow and get the pension. It was completely gratuitous, as we say, a gratuitous promise. It was really given for past consideration in recognition of all of the service she had provided in the past. No strings attached to it. And she quits. And they pay the pension for a while, and then they stop. And she comes and she complains. And she can't win on a contract theory because there were no strings attached. There was no quid pro quo but she was successfully able to argue that she had detrimentally relied on the promise in that she had quit sooner than she otherwise would have. And so she would have kept working was her argument. She would have continued to make money. And now she was out that money. She's actually worse when they stopped paying the pension than if they never made the promise. So promissory estoppel can potentially work as an alternative when you have so-called past consideration. 
And Dan, on that point, I think that's very important for the listeners to really digest where you, you feel bad that they're going to lose on the consideration point and you just, you, your heart bleeds for the, the plaintiff and you want to rescue them under, uh, you know, consideration, but it's just not going to happen. And this is where you really just have to know your rules and find that alternate doctrine that works. And so I just want the listeners to really kind of contemplate that for a moment and realize if there's no bargain for exchange, there's no consideration. And if there is no consideration, what are my backup doctrines? Uh, you know, we, we've there are others too we, we haven't covered yet, but you as a student need to be keeping track of those so that you know where to take your professor alternatively outside of contract land. And it's always good as a student to put yourself in the shoes of each party and try to think, how can I win this case for this party? You want to do it for both. You want to, for the plaintiff, it's like, how do I win the case for the defendant? How do I make sure the plaintiff doesn't win the case? But if you think in those terms, how do I get my client from point A to point B? B is a recovery, some compensation. Then you might be thinking a little bit more about, okay, what arrows do I have in the quiver that I can potentially shoot and see if they will hit? And yes, there are there, the promissory estoppel arrows in the quiver. I mean, let me tell you something. I think that arrow is a little blunt and a little crooked maybe, and it ain't the best arrow. You're, the first arrow, if you, if, if possible, you, if you possibly got a contract argument, the first arrow you should pull out of your quiver is contract. It's going to have, it, it's the sharpest. It's going to be the best chance to win. Usually give that a shot first, but if that goes astray, yeah, pull out that promissory estoppel. Uh, era. Do you like that? We've had the tennis. Now I'm shifting into archery. So I love it. I think it works. Yeah. So archery is the theme for this one. Um, don't forget in a case with past consideration, don't only think alternatively about a promise or estoppel claim if there's been detrimental reliance by the promisee on the promise. Also think about quasi contract. Because uh, remember, if Steve has helped me in a time of need, there might be a claim that I've been enriched unjustly and should have to pay him for the services he provided to me. But be careful. Remember that with quasi-contract and this implied in law promise that the court will create, generally, when you're providing a service, generally, the party providing the service had to have acted without making an offer. So if I'm delirious and I don't know what I'm doing, that's a, probably a pretty good explanation as to why we wouldn't expect Steve to say to me, hey, I've got an offer for you. Maybe it was an emergency. He couldn't sit there and negotiate. But secondly, in general, Steve would have had to have had a reasonable expectation that he was going to be compensated for his services, which usually means that he typically charges for what he's doing. And so if Steve is just a, a director of academic success and he's not a nurse or a doctor or a paramedic and he normally doesn't charge for that, he most likely is not going to get a recovery. Again, good Samaritans don't get recoveries even in quasi-contract, it's terrible, Steve, even in quasi-contract, you go to quasi-contract, well, you think you're going to get a good reception. quasi contracts all about injustice. And the Good Samaritan shows up and asks for help. And the Good Samaritan is told by quasi contract yeah, now get out of here. You were a Good Samaritan. We give money to people who, eat you, who, it was re, who were reasonable for them to expect to be paid for what they're doing. They usually charge for it, not that give it away for free. All right. Uh, moral obligation. Oh, Steve, I hate this phrase. Hate it, hate it, hate it. I'll tell you why. Well, I love it and I hate it. Okay. I, I, I hate it because moral obligation makes it sound like it's this big encompassing doctrine that anytime there's a moral obligation to keep your promise, you should. Well, you know what? That probably is 99% of all promises. Probably, right? And I'm getting a little bit concerned 
that my students are transitioning too much from layperson to lawyer. I asked recently, you know, well, is there a moral obligation to keep a promise? And the class seemed to be pretty confident there was no moral obligation to keep a promise. It's only been four weeks. <laughs> I didn't ask legal obligations, I said moral. Class one, yes. is there a moral obligation to keep a promise? Of course there is, yes, there is. You've then, already worked it out of them. You've, they're, they're devoid of their humanity already. And, and I really, that wasn't my point. I wasn't, <laughs> this is not my goal, Steve. I'm trying, I'm trying to make sure they understand the difference between morality and law. Not that like they like forget about morality, just that they keep them separated. I didn't ask. Yeah. Them to <laughs> well, there's only so much room in the brain. I don't know that you can have both, you know, in the in the one L year. It, you're, you're, that is so true. We're cramming so much in there. You're right. The morality just pops out. <laughs> <laughs> it's just gone. <laughs> Terrible. The problem is, maybe is it possible for too many lawyers? It just never comes back. I don't know. I'm just, yeah. just asking the question. I'm not taking any position on that. I'm just asking. Okay. <laughs> so I got a problem with this doctrine of moral obligation because it suggests that it is more than it is. You hear this doctrine of moral obligation. And if you've kept your humanity, you're like, oh, wow, this is awesome. This is going to make all these promises binding. Forget about it. Are you serious? Have you been following what we do? No, we don't do that. But it also is nice because it's very easy as a wrong multiple choice answer. Because I can put C, moral obligation, because there's a moral obligation to keep that promise. So the fact that it seems broad, I don't like because it confused students. But the fact that it might confuse students actually gives me nice ammunition for wrong multiple choice answers. And I don't know if that's immoral of me to do. But that's what I do. So I take advantage of its, its broad, its, its, its apparent broadness. I think it's very legal to do that, though. But it is, it is something that you have to work through as a student, where, where it, it is hard to make this adjustment from a layperson to a lawyer. But it, it, it also really requires some precision that you're not used to yet. And so I think 1Ls are really trying to learn that precision. But seeing the value of precision is should be jumping out at students about now if they keep reading these contracts questions. And what's, and I think what you mean by because what's so great about this is that that when we talk about precision in a situation like this, we mean the precision of understanding that the doctrine is not named precisely. So the moral obligation doctrine, you have to understand to be, you need to be precise about what the moral obligation doctrine is. And if you think the moral obligation doctrine means there's since there's a moral obligation to keep all promises, it must mean all promises are legally binding, you are, you're incorrect. And so, yeah, that precision is kind of recognizing that these are, these like past consideration. You think, well, to, to be precise, there must be consideration because it says it, but it's not. So the precision is recognizing that we use, we name legal doctrines in a way that is not precise. And the moral obligation doctrine is quite limited. So there are some courts, not many, that will have a broader definition to this. They often call this the, the material benefit rule, the past benefit rule, which is that anytime a party makes a promise to somebody in recognition of having received a prior benefit, that the promise should be legally binding, um, basically if injustice would occur. Uh, their statement has a test. I don't teach this rule because it is a, what we call a minority rule. Most states have rejected it. Their statement adopts it, but it is aspirational. Uh, and I think we've talked about Webb versus McGowan, maybe the guy jumps with the pine block and he's falling with the pine block and it lands on his boss and his boss promises to pay this guy money. And the question is, is the promise legally binding? Well, it's certainly not legally binding as part of a contract because it was past consideration. The guy, you know, the guy tried to divert it. I mean, I know it landed on him, but it could have been a lot worse. He moved it over a little bit and just like crushed his leg where it could have landed on his head. So he was injured, but the guy did save his life. And so the victim promises the guy that he'll pay him uh, for, uh, he said, oh, wait, I'm sorry. See, I don't teach you kids. I got it all wrong. What happened was, the, it's like a, it's like I'm, I'm terrible telling a bad joke. No, that's not the way the joke goes. About that. <laughs> is the guy diverted it, missed his boss, but it landed as he diverted it. It landed on part of his leg, and so the poor guy 
who had saved the other guy himself was injured. And the boss who's standing there, I guess, okay, looks at this poor guy and says, oh my gosh, I'll pay for your medical bills. And of course, that's not consideration because the benefit had already been provided. He saved the guy's life, then the promise came. This court in Webb versus McGowan said, well, we think this promise should be legally binding under, because there's under this past benefit rule, it's also sometimes called promissory restitution. I received a benefit and then I promised to pay for the benefit. But most courts are gonna say, get out of here. That's not legally binding. Um, the moral obligation doctrine does apply at times, but it's much narrower than that, much narrower than we saw what was going on in Webb versus McGowan that we saw in their statement. The moral obligation doctrine for most courts is limited to a situation where a debtor promises to re to pro re promises to pay a debt owed to their creditor. So I owe you money. I owe you hundred dollars, let's say, Steve. And oftentimes in the hypothetical, the debt is uh, long past due. Maybe the, even the statute of limitations has run. So technically, I don't have a legal obligation to pay you anything anymore. I'm in the clear, but I'm being a good guy, and I actually re-promise to pay off the debt. And the general rule is, if a person, and this is not a minority rule, this is what most courts go with this, is if I re-promise to pay the debt to you, that promise, although not supported by any new consideration, if you think about it, it's only supported by past consideration, the past money you gave to me, and then I re-promise, getting nothing new for that re-promise, which has maybe been extinguished because of the statute of limitations is run. That re-promise, although only supported by so-called past consideration, is considered legally binding in and of itself. And what that means is it commences a new statute of limitations. And the creditor now can come back and sue on what would otherwise have been a dead, stale claim to now sue on this new promise. And Steve, it gets, it gets worse. The promise can be, the promise to repay it will be inferred from an acknowledgement of the debt or from part payment of the debt. So it's kind of ugly, right? You're trying to be a nice, talk about, so Good Samaritan, see, we're not only getting recovery in some of these cases we talked about, the nice guy is actually worse off. In so if I try to pay you 30 of the 100 I owe you, now I'm on the hook for the 100 again? Part payment is construed as a promise to pay the debt, yes. If you, if you repay the whole debt, if you promise to pay a smaller part, it's only legally binding that repromise up to that smaller part plus interest. So if I promise to pay your part, that's just, or it just uh, it revives part of it, that part that I promised. But a part payment is construed as a promise to pay off the debt that is owed because otherwise it's doing nothing, right? Because you paid it. Hey, you've got it. And so it's a very nasty rule. Now there is some benefit, a little bit of help here for the debtor, which is that other than part payment, a promise to pay the debt, including an acknowledgement, has to be in a signed writing by the promisor. So that's the good news is that there's a little bit of protection on an evidentiary, from an evidentiary standpoint, but it has to be in writing signed by uh, the debtor, but it is still a nasty rule. If you think about it, you don't know that the statute is run and that you don't owe any money, you're hounded for the money and you send a letter saying, acknowledging, yes, yes, I promise to pay and I'll pay it off. Boom, you just started a new statute of limitations. If you deny that you owe the money, you can avoid this rule. So if you giving it or part of it or promising, but at the same time stating, I don't owe it, then you're okay because you're not promising to, you're not really indicating that you owe the money or acknowledging that you owe the money. But if you don't do that, 
you are on the hook for the rest of it. So this is sort of this is if you think about this is an exception to the general rule that you know past consideration the promise is not legally binding. It's going to make it legally binding this past consideration. But please be aware, this does not mean there is consideration. The promise is considered legally binding even though there is not consideration. So it is an exception to the general requirement that you need consideration to make a promise legally binded. So this, this sounds like its own little thing and to keep it separate from any other fact situation. It, it, it sort of reminds me back when uh, in an earlier uh, lesson, we were talking about um, reliance not being necessary for promissory estoppel in the context of a gift to a church or a charity. According to the, according to the restatement. Right, where it was like this own little niche thing. And those are so important to keep track of in your uh, outline or your notes and keep that separate as its own. Like there's just these weird little things where they only govern that particular factual scenario. And so your professor's not testing you on some bigger thing if they're giving you that particular fact pattern. And those are always so confusing, I think, to students to keep track of those. Yeah, indeed. And I can give a little bit of background to this if that might help students sort of understand why we have this little unusual pocket. The idea was that if you had a legal duty to pay, that was a lot different than a situation where you were simply making a promise based upon some prior benefit that was given to you gratuitously and you didn't have any legal obligation at the time to pay for it. This was viewed different. This was viewed as, look, this was not a gift at the time you were, let's say, loaned money and you made a, the only reason you got the money was because you promised to repay it, of course. And then, so you had a legal duty. And then the only reason why you don't have a legal duty anymore is because the statute of limitations is run. Now, this exception does apply under the statement, even if the statute hasn't run, it'll start a new one running. But the general idea was that the statute of limitations really shouldn't be used in a situation like this when the party is, if the point of the statute of limitations largely is evidentiary and you seem to be engaged in actions, which is pretty clear, it's like an acknowledgement that you've got the, you've had the debt. And when I say, and I know statute of limitations isn't just evidentiary. It's also at a certain point, people should get to move on with their lives and have to worry about someone coming after them for something. But also, I think the idea about, you know, faded memories and did it really happen? And, you know, if you're coming back and you had a legal duty at one point, and, and the only reason you don't now is simply because the statute of limitations has run and you're agreeing to pay it, it just seems like the statute of limitations should no longer be a bar to that claim. Uh, yeah, especially no. if you have a signed writing by the debtor, too. I mean, that eliminates the evidentiary concern there. I think the thing that still gets me is that whole partial payment rule that's I, surprising. It seems shocking. I think the part payment is probably also the belief that it, that it's something tangible to show uh, that it existed. It probably takes in lieu of the writing. I mean, I, I assume in many cases it might be a check, which I guess then you kind of got a writing, um, you know, probably most as opposed to an envelope of cash arrives in the mail. So, I, you know, that's just me speculating. But my guess is that if you're actually transferring money to somebody, we're assuming it can be proven. And the question is, well, that's strange. Why are you doing that? And, and it's considered significant enough from an evidentiary standpoint. But this, this doctrine was not a loaner, right? So Steve, you mentioned how this is kind of a loan now, and it is kind of a loan now. It used to have friends. <laughs> it's, been, it's, been it, it's like me. And then I learned a lot of contracts and went to law school. And now I, I'm, you know, solitude is my, my friend now. Exactly right, right? And so, <laughs> if, you, know, you, you know, you always have a lot. You, Steve, you are <laughs> never alone. 
when you have the law with you and you know the law is a jealous mistress as they say right so you know, <laughs> that's right I, I can i can go to bed with my restatement right next to me doesn't everyone do that <laughs> that's is that odd so 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 they had friends it, it its friends were number one a promise to pay a debt that had been discharged in bankruptcy but the problem with that one is the bankruptcy code came in saying like, yeah, no, we need to get with common law. Well, excuse me, we'll handle this. <laughs> so, you you know, know, when the feds show up, you just got to run away. Yes, yes. The feds showed up. They definitely had a warrant. <laughs> they, 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 they were allowed to be there. They had jurisdiction. And it was sort of like, look, common law, you shouldn't be messing with bankruptcy issues. We'll deal with, with you know, whether or not a bankrupt person who's had their debt discharged can renew that and would be responsible. And so now the bankruptcy code covers that. And the other one that was hanging out with it was actually ratification of a debt incurred by a minor, which so minors would of course incur a debt and we know it's voidable and they would void it. And then they'd come back later and they would, um, and they would say, you know, okay, I'm going to ratify it. This has sort of been shuffled off to, we'll talk about this down the road. That's really just been shuffled off to, for the most part, just the doctrine of ratifying a voidable contract when you're a minor. So what sort of happened was his buddies or her buddies, sort of they, you know, you know that's what happens like you're in high school, they move away. They go to different <laughs> colleges, right? They, they, they get they married. They grow apart. They, yeah, they grow apart. I mean, this is before Facebook. I mean, it was Facebook, they still be buddies. This yeah, the, yeah, there's no forwarding address, especially when the feds took the took one rule and then the other one right. was faded away. What happened? That last, what happened to that dude? Last time I saw him, the feds were carrying him away. <laughs> right. I, from again. I don't know what happened to that dude. So I think he went bankrupt. He went very good. So um, and the other one grew up. So um, so the this moral obligation doctrine actually, if you think about it, all three of those were premised on this idea that you had. A legal duty at some point in a way and you should pay for it but something technical had sort of allowed you to escape responsibility but if you came back and you then like you know acknowledged it later after that was sort of removed those, those problems were removed then you should be responsible and that's where it came from but now it's just sort of we've got this this you know credit or debtor one hanging out and just keep in mind, though, how limited it is. So if you hear about the doctrine of moral obligation, if your professor is, teaches you Webb versus McGowan, you read Webb versus McGowan, and you get the restatement provision on promises to pay for a past benefit, sometimes called broadly the moral obligation doctrine or the material benefit doctrine, well, then, OK, this doctrine is going to be broader for you and in your class. But if you never hear about Webb versus McGowan in a falling pine block and you never see their statement provision on a promise for a past benefit, you never hear the phrase promissory restitution, all you hear about with respect to moral obligation is when a debtor re-promises to pay their past debt. Now you know, okay, my professor is keeping this pretty limited as most courts will do. And I'm not going to fall for this idea that this moral obligation doctrine is some broad, big doctrine, which is coming in and making a lot of promises binding because there's a moral obligation. It's not designed to do that. It's, you know, it's a little bit like, I don't know, it's going to like Greenland. That's maybe not the best. Past consideration is more like Greenland. Like, yeah, hey, we're not green at all, right? We're trying to convince people we're green or not. Moral obligation is a little bit like that, too. Uh, maybe it's like calling something a kingdom and you show up there and it's a few blocks. Okay, you call yourself a kingdom, but you're kind of small. All right, illusory promise. Do you know what the hardest thing is about illusory promise, Steve? I remember thinking it was very, very hard. Like I didn't, I couldn't spot it. I, I, I frankly, I couldn't, I couldn't even see it. Well, you know what the hardest thing for students is? It's not seeing it. It's saying it. It is illusory. <laughs> Illusory, illusionary. I get them all. And that's, that's, that's fine. I mean, I'm, I'm the guy in law school. I said chattel instead of chattel. I'm, I'm, I'll admit it. So <laughs> I've been there. 
Well, this this one's easy to say because it it has loser in it. Oh, I like. Oh, is that like a bar trick? That's like a bar trick, isn't it? And I think it is. That's what. That's what I. You know, that was an old line I'd give at a bar. You know, at a bar. I'm a loser. <laughs> Hi, I'm a loser. -y. That only works for George Costanza on Seinfeld. I don't know if you saw that episode, but we won't talk about that. Where he he told the truth about everything, and he says so. He he he's more successful the dating by actually saying hey i'm a total loser i live with my parents i live in a basement and so people want to take care of me okay it's quite novel huh it's quite novel to be honest it is it is novel probably wears off pretty quickly though they're like okay yeah i'm like tired of you being a loser illusory an illusory promise is not a promise it is it's a deceiver steve it is an illusion it wants you to believe it is a promise but it's not and the reason why this is quite important is because often, most of the time, the consideration in a bargain for exchange is, the, is a promise. In a bilateral contract, it's a promise for a promise. In a unilateral contract, it is a promise in exchange for a performance. And so if something is supposed to be the consideration and it's a promise, but it's not actually a promise, it's masquerading as a promise, we got a problem because now we don't have consideration. So if I give you a promise and you give me a promise, they're in exchange. But one of our promises is a so-called illusory promise. Then there is no consideration because we only have half of a deal, so to speak. And you know what this means? This means that if, let's say I've given you the illusory promise and you've given me a real promise. If I don't perform, you obviously cannot successfully sue me for breach because it's impossible to breach an illusory promise. You try to prove I breached it and you're just like, you know, your hand's going right through it. There's nothing there, <laughs> but it gets more entertaining. It also means that if you breached your true promise and I sued you, you could say, wait a second, my promise, Steve's promise is not legally binding. Yes, it's a real promise and yes, I breached it, but I did not get any consideration in exchange for my promise because O'Gorman's alleged promise is not a promise, it's illusory, and therefore I got nothing. There was no exchange, and therefore my promise is not part of a contract, so I can breach with impunity. So that's the relevance of something being an illusory promise. So what is that gonna look like? How do we know we're being tested on an illusory promise? You got it. So I will give you, the classic example, which is almost never the way it actually appears. So we'll start with that. <laughs> then you go, okay. That's very reassuring. Well, you know, look, uh, you know, illusory promises are, you know, they're skilled at the art of illusion. And so you really think they're gonna come in that obvious way that we, you know, did the basic way that we, are you kidding me? They, and I think that's, yeah, that's why I could never see this. I, I remember being frustrated that I didn't catch it when I should have. And I felt like, oh, man, I should have seen that. So it's like one of those things that's hard to get used to seeing. Well, you did much better in the spring than the fall. So you got better. That was your fall semester, right? Probably. I think probably. But I, in consideration, yeah. But it's one of those things is like reading comprehension is key here. Mm -hmm. like, I think to, to critically read the words that are there and process them as you're reading them. And that's the hardest part to get used to, honestly, because there's so many words to read. So many notes, so to speak, mm -hmm. Amadeus, so many words. So <laughs> here, here is, uh, oh, here's the most obvious one. I, Steve, you promised to pay me $50. And in exchange, I promise to wash your car if I feel like it. Mm -hmm. So as you will notice, uh, it may look, I may have used the word promise. It may sound promisey, but it's not a promise under law. Going way back to what is a promise. We talked about how a promise is a promise when the promisee would be justified in understanding that the promisor has made a commitment. And if I am qualifying my obligation to perform, based solely upon whether I feel like it or not, completely within my discretion, whether I'm going to do it, then you would not be justified in understanding that I've made a commitment. 
I haven't made a commitment. And please, please, please don't argue and tell me, well, wait a second. You're committing to do it if you feel like it. All right. Hilarious. Give me a break. That's not a commitment, you know, because all I have to do is be like, oh, I don't feel like it. That's not a commitment. I think a commitment, let's face it, isn't a commitment when you're agreeing to do it, even if you don't feel like it. That's really how about you award? How about you award the points to that student if you feel like it? There you go. Right. <laughs> do they feel like they got in a commitment? You're exactly right. Do you feel like do you feel like you received a commitment in that situation? Probably not. Are you gonna like sleep better at night? Probably not. So so that's that's its most basic that would be like that would be like i want to be an illusory promise but i'm like i'm like a newbie at it like this is my first day on the job like okay i just i just learned or i'm training i'm in training to be an illusory promise that's like day one like okay this is what you need to do you need to say i promise to wash your car if if i feel like it okay and i go out okay i promise to wash your car if i feel like it how am i doing boss great great day one great Right. You need like a David Copperfield, like apprenticeship or yeah. something when you're at that level. That's right. You are. Yeah. You're, you're actually being, you're at that point, you're like an apprentice to do like low level birthday parties. Right. <laughs> yes. birthday, that. Right. Dress up as a clown. for Right. You, you can do that. Yay. Congratulations. <laughs> but now, right. We're ready. Now we're going to move to, you ready to go to Vegas? Let's do it. This we're is make this statue of liberty. I, and I'm pretty sure this is what I totally failed at as a student. Like well, with the, the, the harder ones to see. Because this is like making the Statue of Liberty disappear. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So the difference between an illusory promise and what is a real promise, when a party has discretion over whether they're going to perform, is whether or not that discretion is complete and unlimited, or is it limited, qualified? So an illusory, a real promise can be breached, an illusory promise cannot. So a way to test whether something is an illusory promise or not is to simply test it. Is it possible that the party can breach the promise? If they can't, there's no way they can, then it's illusory. If it is possible, even if it's unlikely, it's not illusory. So this is the way, so right off the bat, things, things that are qualifications which the party has no control over. Do not make it illusory. I promise to wash your car if it is sunny tomorrow. That is not an illusory promise. It might be what we call conditional, meaning uh, there's events which would mean I don't have to perform, but I obviously don't have any control over the weather. Uh, you know, Steve, people always complain about the weather, but no one ever does anything about it. Did you find that strange? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've never really thought. Vegas. It's Vegas. Yeah. I'm always. Okay. <laughs> so, so I don't have control over whether it rains or not. So that can't make an illusory promise. That's very different than I promise to wash your car if I feel like it. I have control over whether I feel like it or not. Please don't tell me I don't. I have control over my emotions. Well, that's not really accurate, but you know what I'm saying. So if an event, qualifies it, but the event is outside of my control, then it is not illusory. Now, let's get to the harder one. The qualification is something within my control. If it's something within my control, it's still not illusory if there is some sort of limitation on my control. So, for example, I promise to wash your car but not it but only if you don't pay me fifty dollars first or you don't breach first if there is some if there is some event and i guess that's really i mean that's something that's outside of my control but even if it is something within my control if it's still possible i could breach it then it is not illusory. So for example, I promise to wash your car, you know, if I do not sell something of mine, you know, because I may mean, I need the money, it, it provided I don't sell something next week. 
even though this is in some respects within my control, it's not a loser because it's possible I could breach it. Because if I don't sell this thing within a week, then I am obligated to perform. The way these typically, you typically see these in, in the real, you don't see them like this usually. The way you see them is they tend to come in contracts as part of what we call a notice of termination or notice of cancellation clause. So a contract might have a provision that says the party has the power to terminate this contract. This is what you're looking for really most of the time. This, if you're looking for an illusory promise issue or on a law school exam or on a, you know, on a multiple choice question or an essay, you're typically looking for this. You're looking for a provision in a contract that permits one of the parties to cancel or terminate the contract. But this may look like that makes it illusory, but it doesn't necessarily. Number one, as we talked about, it may be something where the, the power to terminate is something where you only have that power if some event occurs and that event is not within your control. So I have the power to cancel this contract if you breach first. I have the power to cancel this contract if I, uh, you know, if the bank doesn't give me a loan. I have the power to cancel this contract if the government entity doesn't, you know, grant the permit for me to use the land for X. None of that makes the, the promise illusory because it's possible I'll have to perform. I might get the permit. I might get the loan. You might not breach. But even when it is within my control, like let's say I promise to, I, I have the power to terminate this contract upon 90 days notice. This is completely within my control now. I don't need, I can terminate it for any reason, but within 90 days. You might think that this means that my promise is illusory, that all the promises embedded within this contract are now illusory. And this is why it's hard to spot because that notice of termination provision is a separate provision. It's not linked directly with the other promises in the contract. The other provisions also have promise to do this, promise to do this, promise to do this. And then on page seven, you have a notice of termination provision. But if the notice of termination, let's say, allows you to terminate the contract, the reason why an illusory promise issue arises is because that power to terminate potentially renders all of those other promises in the agreement illusory because you really haven't committed the foundation essentially of the contract and of your promises is being removed so if you have if you have the power to terminate but let's say within that you know and upon 90 days notice that is not going to render those other promises illusory if during those 90 days you would potentially have an obligation to perform in some way so for example let's say it's a lease and the landlord has the power to terminate the lease upon 90 days notice. And maybe the tenant does too. If the lease term, you know, the lease term's already started, you know, or will start, then it is not illusory because the landlord and the tenant are each committing to at least perform for 90 days. They're each committing the tenant to pay rent for 90 days, the landlord to lease the space for 90 days, and so there may not be a lot of commitment. There might be less commitment than if you didn't have the notice of termination provision, but you still have 90 days of commitment, at least 90 days of commitment there. And that's enough commitment. We talk about the peppercorn theory below, that's enough. But when the notice of termination provision says either party, or maybe just say one party, one particular party has the power to terminate this contract at any time, at any time without notice, now you probably have an illusory, all the promises in there are probably illusory, particularly, particularly if they have the power to terminate at any time for any reason with or without notice. Now, when it says that, that basically means any time the party, at you know, any time, they can just cancel the thing. They don't have to give any sort of advance notice. They could do it any way they want. They don't need, they don't have to like send a writing even. That clearly courts are going to say now it is illusory because if you think about it, now what it's basically saying is I will continue to perform as long as I feel like it at that point in time. 
And that's what you're looking for. Those, that is the David Copperfield, right? The David Copperfield yeah. is the notice of termination provision dumped on page seven, which just says party X has the power to turn his contract at any time for any reason. And certainly if it says with or without notice, that's David Copperfield because everything in front of that was a promise to do this, promise to do this, promise to do this, promise to do this by the landlord. The landlord promised to do this. They promised to maintain the premises. They promised to give you, you know, quiet enjoyment. They promised to do this. They promised to do this. They promised to do it for a year. It says a year, at least two years a year. And then you got that termination provision, which says they can terminate this lease at any time uh, for any reason. And maybe even says, make it a clearest case, even without notice, boom. Now you've got an illusory promise. And the good news for, I mean, the bad news for the tenant is there's no commitment by the landlord. But the good news for the tenant is there's no consideration for their promise. So presumably they can also leave too without any liability because they've not gotten any consideration for their promise to rent the place for a year. And when you get back to that other way of testing to see if the promise is illusory, there can never be a breach in that scenario because each party can say, I just left. I, 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 I canceled it. I, I exercised my right to back out completely. Exactly right. You just asked that. So yeah, is there any way tenant could breach? And the answer is no, there's no way. I mean, landlord, there's no way. So therefore it must be illusory. The trickier issue, which we don't have a lot of law on, and so I don't tend to talk about it much, is whether or not the requirement of written notice to terminate is itself now a limitation on your discretion to terminate. Uh, because so now it's like you can't just simply terminate, even if you can terminate any time. Uh, if you've got to give written notice, does that mean that you are committing at least to giving notice and therefore? you've made a commitment enough to give consideration, uh, check your jurisdiction. Um, I think it's nonsense to say that that's consideration. I don't think that's what, I don't know that you're bargaining for written notice, but there yeah. are some courts that have suggested that mere requirement of written notice is enough to make it, the promises in that agreement not illusory. So check your professor. So, you know, check your professor, check your jurisdiction on that one. Yeah, it does seem kind of like that whole contract law is not about gotcha. Uh, and and that, no, that written notice is kind of so, smacks of gotcha to me. I think courts are very reluctant to say that, they're, they're very reluctant to say that deals fail for lack of consideration. And so I think they don't like to find promises illusory. And so I think this is one of the things that they do is that they then are tempted to say a requirement of written notice is alone enough to make mean there's a commitment and therefore consideration. Um, but uh, like I said, check your jurisdiction. So, all right, how do you, you feel a little bit better about that? I mean, I don't know that I did a great job explaining that stuff. Um, no, I, I think it's actually, you know, that's very helpful because those are just a couple of things to look out for that I can really kind of hold on to. I'm looking for a couple of things. I mean, it's not an unlimited number of ways that your professor could test you on an illusory promise. Yeah, and on that a period of notice, I mean, it, it, presumably, there's got to be some way that you'd have a commitment in that notice period. Uh, so if the parties enter into a contract and there's 10 days to cancel it um, before they do anything and they're not even obligated to do anything before those 10 days, can't demand anything from anyone before those 10 days, presumably no contract forms until those 10 days pass. And if, if they, you know, one of the parties or neither parties uh, cancel the contract before those 10 days and the contract actually forms after those 10 days pass because before then there's no commitment. All right. Let's talk about implied in fact promises. And remember, Sue, we talked about when we were discussing promises, how a lot of this stuff would pay dividends later, hopefully. And this is one of those situations. I mean, the loser promise was hopefully understanding what a promise is will pay dividends later. Understanding that a promise is a commitment. Hopefully that now helps to pay dividends with a loser promise. Implied in fact promise. Remember, an implied in fact promise is a real promise. It's not express, but it's not implied in law. The court isn't creating it as a fiction. We think it was actually made. It was just made 
uh, implicitly or impliedly. Uh, an implied in fact promise is when a reasonable person would believe that someone is promising to do something even though they're not expressly promising to do it. And typically it is through uh, conduct, the circumstances, and also sometimes coupled with verb with statements that are not necessarily promissory in nature. So you jump into a cab, remember, and you say, take me to Times Square. Well, you've both jumped in the cab, conduct, and you've also said something, take me to Times Square. Under the circumstances, those two events, it's reasonable to believe and that the person is promising to pay for the cab ride. That is an implied, in fact, promise. Well, consideration, if you're, need, if you're wanting a promise as consideration, an implied, in fact, promise will work as consideration just as well as an express promise. It might be harder sometimes to find that a promise was made when it isn't express, but once you conclude that a promise was made, the fact that it happens to have been an implied in fact promise does not mean that it cannot be used as consideration. You know, it's like implied in fact promises. Once they're promises, don't, don't put me in a corner. Don't talk down to me. I'm a real, it's like Pinocchio, right? One day I'll be a real boy. Well, they are a real boy, right? It's a real promise. And as a real promise, I get all of the perks of being a real promise. And that includes, I get to be consideration for a contract. Uh, and so implied in fact promise will work. And probably every law student has read, will read, unless they're slacking, Wood versus Lucy Lady Duff Gordon. Look at that smile. Uh, I'm so excited. I just, old yeah, I, I just hear the case name and it just makes me happy. That is awesome. So yes, Wood versus Lucy Lady Duff Gordon. It was uh, Judge Cardoza, who's on the New York Court of Appeals at the time before he ascended to the US Supreme Court. And Cardoza, one of our greatest judges, decides this case on the New York Court of Appeals, where uh, Lucy Lady Duff Gordon, who was on the Titanic, survived. And Lucy Lady Duff Gordon, a fashion designer, the case has nothing to do with the Titanic. That's just an aside. A fashion designer, that's, you know, that's the students, they perk up. You know, I'm talking about the facts and they're all sleeping. And then you mentioned she's on the Titanic and there was a little scene in the movie that was cut, which I think you can find on YouTube. Now they're all, they're all awake and interested. So Lucy Lady of Garden, a famous fashion designer, uh, hires Otis Wood to uh, sell, to market her designs. And she promises to pay him a commission and for any deals he makes. And he promises to serve as um, uh, uh, to, to she, well, it's not clear he promises to do, it's a one-year deal. It's supposed to be a one-year deal where she will pay him 50%, I think it was, I can't remember the percentage, for any deals that he makes. And it was a one year. So she granted him a one year, basically exclusive license to sell her stuff. Well, the problem was, so she gets a deal with Sears Roba and company. You know, they're coming out with the catalog. Remember the Sears Roba catalog? Oh, and, and this thing was huge. I know people think now, if you're listening, you're like, oh, Sears is that worn out, uh, empty shell of a building with crappy stuff in it. That was not true back then. No, and this and the and the Sears Roebuck was huge. I think they were like one of the first ones where they would come out with a catalog and you order stuff. I guess it was huge, the Sears Roebuck catalog. And she advertised, she put her stuff in the Sears Roebuck catalog. And Otis Wood, of course, went crazy during because it was during the one year period. He's like, "Hey, I got an exclusive license," and he sues her for breach. And because he's saying, "Look, I should have made that money," and she argues that's not a contract. It may look like a contract, it might be in writing, it might have a wealth of recitals, but it's not a contract. I know I promised to grant you an exclusive license, but you didn't give me anything in return. You certainly didn't give me a return promise to make it a bilateral contract and binding for the year, 
maybe it's like a unilateral. If you sell this stuff, I'll give you 50%, but I can revoke that offer any time. It was not a bilateral contract. There's no promise for a promise for a year. And there was no express promise. If you looked through that written agreement, you found no promise express by Otis Wood to make to do anything. No promise to use reasonable efforts to sell her stuff, nothing. And so she argued there's no consideration. And what Judge Cardozo famously held was a reasonable person would believe based upon the circumstances and the nature of this agreement that Otis Wood was impliedly promising to use reasonable efforts to sell her stuff. And once you find an implied in fact promise by Otis Wood being given in exchange for her promise to grant him the exclusive license for a year, now you have the consideration necessary from Otis Wood going to Lucy Lady Duff Gordon to support her promise and make it legally binding because it's now part of a contract. So strangely, it's actually better for Otis Wood here that he is committing to do something as opposed to not committing to do something. The fact that he's committing to do something actually is what is going to help him enforce her promise. Um, and so an implied in fact promise is sufficient to make a, a, uh, a contract. Keep in mind, the trick here is not knowing just that, but some of it is understanding when it is reasonable to infer a promise. So it, when you read Lucy Lady Duff Gordon, the great thing about Lucy Lady Duff Gordon is not, oh, okay, what's the takeaway that an implying fact promise counts as consideration, just like an express promise, yawn, the, the takeaway is how Cardozo goes through the deal and says, look, it's reasonable to infer for all these reasons, and he gives them all, that Otis Wood was promising to, impliedly to use reasonable efforts. And that's really the key is, is how, what facts can you use to infer a promise? And what's great about it is Cardozo barely pulls it off. If I recall correctly, it was four to three. So Cardozo barely pulls it off, um, uh, but uh, that's sort of, for me, the big takeaway. That's so interesting that it was so divided, that ruling, because it, you know, to go the other way would have allowed her to completely take advantage of him under this written agreement. Well, the argument is that he is, you know, maybe he's all that. And she's willing to, it's reasonable to believe she's willing to grant him this exclusive license, just hoping you, great Otis Wood, will, <laughs> knowing it's in your interest to try to sell my stuff because there's money to be made, that you will do it. So I'm actually willing to grant you this exclusive license for a year with no, I ask no commitment from you, Otis Wood. You're Otis Wood. <laughs> I just... I just ask you to consider selling my stuff. I would never ask you to commit. Oh, great one. That's <laughs> sort of, uh, now look, I don't know that that's, I mean, I don't know that that's reasonable to believe that. Obviously, Cardoza didn't think it was reasonable to believe that, but that sort of would be the fight, right? I mean, if you had interesting facts where Cardoza, where Wood was this like amazing guy, you know, maybe now some of those facts change the court's belief. And Apparently, there were other contracts with Otis Wood where he made express promises to use effort. So apparently, there was, and I don't know if that was came out in that case, that may have been subsequent research that was done on the case, but it was sort of also kind of odd that there wasn't an express promise, particularly with somebody as savvy as Lucy Lady Duff Gordon. Where's the promise? I mean, the contract, you know, this, this written agreement is detailed. It's got a wealth of recitals. It's in writing. Why is there not a promise there? And I think the three probably, and I don't think they wrote a, an opinion, but the, the lower court, I think, had sided with the dissent, if I recall correctly, um, and did write it up and were basically very kind of, very unwilling, if I recall, to infer a promise. They were very reluctant to infer a promise 
I think when you're dealing with two sophisticated parties and it would have been very easy to do and there it isn't there, they were kind of not wanting to maybe inject and start inferring promises when it would have been so easy to do so and kind of strange that it hadn't been done. Cardozo is, you know, kind of says, eh, that's way too, you know, that's way too much formalism for Cardozo that it's just the writing, it's not the writing, it ain't there. That's not Cardozo really, right? Cardozo is more modern. And so it, it's a famous opinion in large part, mainly really not just for well, and applying in fact promise is consideration. Yawn, what's really more famous about is seeing that the courts are getting more willing to infer promises, even when you're talking about two sophisticated parties who easily could have put it in there. You may have expected to. Cardozo's willing to be like, yeah, come on, guys, give me a break. Surely he's a reasonable person would think he's committing. Where maybe the three in dissent are kind of like more old school and are like, Cardozo, you going soft, buddy. What's wrong? <laughs> Why are, you, why, are you help, why are you helping out Otis Wood? That guy doesn't need our help. He's rich, man. He doesn't need our help, you know? So. It's the Otis Wood, for goodness sake. Right? I mean, come on, man. And, and anyway, don't we need to teach, teach Otis Wood a lesson? You know, if you keep doing this, Cardozo, he's never going to learn his lesson. And he's, never, he's always going to be sloppy on his contract. And you're just going to get more sloppy contracts in front of you, Judge Cardozo. You know, it, you know don't blame the three of us. If we start getting a bunch of sloppy gap written contracts, because they're all like, oh, Cardozo will save us. Uh, <laughs> Look at what's going on. So, all righty, mixed motive. All right. So, Steve, it could happen that a promisor makes a promise and they get in exchange for that a return promise, but their motive is mixed, meaning. They are both interested in receiving the return promise, but they are also intending to make a gift. Let me give you an example. Let your, Steve, I like you. You're a nice guy. You helped me when I was that, you know, you found me as a first year contracts professor wandering in the streets, bloody you took me in. I like you. So, and I know how much you've always love this painting behind me, which I paid way too much money for. And you've always admired it. And so Steve, you know what? I'm a, so what I like about the mixed motive cases is like, these are cases where like, Steve, I'm a nice guy, but I ain't that nice. So what I'm gonna say to you is I'm not a hundred percent gift. Uh, so what I say to you, but I'm not a, I'm not a hundred percent bargain. So what I say to you, Steve, look, Steve, I will, I will sell you this painting because I know you've always loved it. And because you're my friend, I'm, I'm going to charge you basically nothing. I'm, I'll sell you this for $50. And you say, I accept. And then I'm like, oh, what was I thinking? And you sue me. And the question is, what was their consideration? Was your promise consideration, your promise to pay the $50 consideration for my promise to give you the painting? And the concern here, of course, is that this, it looks like my motive was not to receive the promise for the $50 primarily. My primary motive was to, I wanted to gift you this painting, but I, want, I also want to get 50 bucks, but primarily it was to give you a gift. So a real person, would likely believe that my principal motive here was to give you a gift. And my secondary lesser motive was to get your return promise to pay me the $50. And the question arises, is that still consideration? And what the courts say is, yes, it is. So when you have a mixed motive, what we call a mixed bargain slash gift, and keep in mind, we look at motive objectively. We talk a lot about the objective theory of contract with respect to offer and acceptance. Consideration and whether there is the requisite bargain motive between the parties is also assessed objectively. Unless I, you know that the person is not motivated in any way to have a bargain. 
if there's any sort of misunderstanding and it's, you know, I, I'm intending just a bargain, a gift motive. You, you think that I've got part bargain motive. We, we apply the objective theory test. So that's a general rule, just like anything else, even though we're looking for intent and motive, we're assessing it objectively at the time. What would a reasonable person have believed? And here, as long as a reasonable person would believe that any part of the promise source motive was to get what was being given in exchange, even if it was only a very small part of what we suspect was their motive, that is enough and it is consideration. So the fact that you are giving your friend a really good deal and you're just asking for a very small amount of money, think about it. It's not 100% gift. If I wanted to gift that to you, I would have given it to you. And I already own the painting. So it's, it's not really like I'm looking for you to reimburse future costs. I just want to not, I, want to, I don't want to be out anything. I already own the painting. I've already paid for the painting. I'm not, if I charge, if I said, look, I'll mail it to you, but it's going to cost me $10. Do you agree to give me $10? Well, that's not consideration because I'm not motivated to send you the painting for you to reimburse me for my shipping costs. But if I already own the painting, and I'm not incurring any cost in delivering it to you, and I ask you for money, a reasonable person would believe that at least part of my motive is to get the 50 bucks. It ain't a lot. It may not be the main reason I'm doing it, but I could have just given it to you, and I didn't. And courts do not want to try to worry about whether it's reasonable to believe that most of their motive, part of their motive, you shouldn't have to worry about what a reasonable person think most of the motive, part of the motive. It's too messy. It's just easier and cleaner to say, as long as a reasonable person would believe that at least part of the promisor's motive was to get what the other side was giving, there is consideration. And then, it, you know, to go the other way would put the court in the position of judging the adequacy of, of the consideration. And I know courts are reluctant to even play that game. So this part of this just sort of feels like an expediency rule. This absolutely is. And this doctrine, this mixed motive, is going to really be driven, as you've noted, by our next doctrine, which is a so-called peppercorn theory. So the peppercorn theory and the last topic, condition of a gratuitous promise, all sort of link up with mixed motive. All these last three, these last three are now really seems to me about are you bargaining for for it. I like to think of past consideration, moral obligation, illusory promise, implied fact promise. Well, moral obligation is not really, it's not a contract doctrine, right? It's, 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 it's a consideration substitute. And, and but these ideas of, of past consideration is not consideration is like, well, you don't even have exchange because the time is all wrong. Illusory promise, you don't have exchange because one party isn't giving a promise. Implied in fact promise is consideration because it is a promise. So there is an exchange of promises. These last three seem to me to go into this idea of, okay, I like to almost think of it as part is, is, is there now a bargain in the sense, is it reasonable to believe that not only is there an exchange, but that a reasonable person would believe that each party is motivated to make their promise in order to induce the other party to give their promise or their performance. Each party, has to reasonably believe that the other party is motivated to enter this transaction to get what the other is giving. I mean, think about it. That's what makes it a bargain as opposed to a gift. And so the peppercorn theory is this idea, and you've already noted it, that courts do not want to assess the adequacy of the exchange and what is being exchanged. They, they do not want to get involved in deciding whether or not this was a good or a bad deal for one of the parties. It would, it would basically go up against our concern and conflict with our belief that parties are the best judges of what they value, right? See, you were, you were a high school econ professor so I'm sure you, you know, probably talked about this idea of, you know, well, what's a fair price? Well, whatever people pay for it, I think, right? And 
Right, exactly. And, and, you know, would I, a high school teacher, know what a corporation should pay another for something? I have no idea, but the corporation probably does. Right. And it's one of those things where, like, do we want judges jumping into business or do we want judges and, and courts to, to, to maintain legal uh, rules? Yeah, I've got in my book, I start this section with a quote where uh, a famous quote, I paid too much for it, but it was worth it. So it's you know, this idea that you know, when I paid too much for it, you realize, well, maybe for other people, but it was worth it to me. And so courts, if courts assess the adequate, number one, if they assess the adequate exchange, they would somehow be suggesting that there is a, some objective notion of value. And people, right, right so, so beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? Or what is it? One man's trash is another man's treasure. So there really is no way to say how much somebody values it. They, they are the best. What, what the person agreed to pay is the best indication of how much that person valued it. And secondly, it would make it very, it would really upset, I think, the sanctity of contracts. And people would be very concerned, perhaps, about entering into contracts, if they knew parties could come back later and try to get out of it simply because it was a bad deal. Uh, and so courts are very reluctant to do it. So the peppercorn theory is these, this doctrine that provides that cons courts will not say there is no consideration simply because what one party gave is can somehow considered inadequate for what they received. Courts will not assess the adequacy of what is being exchanged. Uh, they will not say there's no consideration simply because there is a, it was a bad bargain for one of the parties. Now, this doesn't mean that this can't be an issue down the road when you try to get out of a contract. We'll talk about the doctrine of unconscionability later when it is a shockingly unfair deal. But right now, all we're thinking about is has a contract formed? Is there consideration? And contract formation is, and consideration is not about, is this a good deal? It's about, is it reason to believe each party was motivated to enter into this deal to get what the other was giving? And the fact that we think they were crazy to want to pay that much for it doesn't necessarily mean we think they weren't motivated to get what they were giving, uh, to get what they were giving, uh, uh, or to give, what they were getting in exchange. And it's called the peppercorn theory because it's this idea that even a little peppercorn, even a peppercorn could be consideration. So a very, something very small in value can be consideration for something much larger. Uh, but I warn students that a peppercorn can be consideration, but it isn't always necessarily. And when students study the peppercorn theory, they probably are going to talk about something called sham consideration or nominal consideration or token consideration. Typically, these are all three ways to say the same thing. If a reasonable person would believe that the parties were not really engaging in a true bargain, that it was just a sham, that they wanted to make it look like a bargain, well, then the so-called peppercorn is not consideration. And I'll give you an example. Let's say, and you may remember this from, from when I taught this case uh, back in the day, a Fisher versus Union Trust, a case out of Michigan, where a dad wants to give his daughter Bertha, Bertha Fisher, a parcel of land that he owns. Well, he's got a mortgage on the land, which of course means it comes encumbered. So when he hands her the deed, and look, he hands her the deed, if he wants to give her the land, that's an executed gift. One of the things you want to remember is that when a promise to give a gift is executed, meaning the gift is delivered and accepted by the donee, now it's property law. The property becomes the possession is owned by the promisee. And a lack of consideration is not grounds to unwind an executed gift. So when he hands her the deed, if that transfers her ownership of the land, fine. 
The lack of consideration of the fact it was a gift doesn't mean he gets to take it back. But what he also did was he wrote on the deed, that, if I recall correctly, that he promised to pay off the mortgage. Well, now that was a promise. That was not a delivered gift because he was promising to pay it off in the future. And he never did. And there was a foreclosure and she sued him or the estate, I assume, after he died probably, saying that was a breach. And the question was, was there any consideration for his promise to pay off the mortgage? And what she said was, well, when it was handed to me, he said, or I think the, her brother said, well, pull out a dollar to make it official and hand him a dollar. And so a dollar was handed over in exchange for this promise to pay off the mortgage. So you do have an exchange, but the problem was, and yes, a dollar can certainly be consideration. And yes, under the peppercorn theory, courts generally do not assess the adequacy of the exchange. But the problem here is, is this reason to believe that, that William Fisher was motivated to promise to pay off the mortgage to get Bertha Fisher to hand him a dollar? Or, no. or, or is it unreasonable to believe that? And is it more reasonable to believe that they were simply using the dollar as a way to make it appear almost like illusion, right? Create the illusion. Yeah. Right. It, it, here's what, like, I see that factual scenario as not having been bargained for. It was an exchange, but it wasn't bargained for. It was just, how do we make this stick? How do we make this official? Ah, pull out a dollar. It was like the, the exchange was already there and it wasn't bargained for. Exactly right. And if you think about it, the students have learned something that should actually help them realize that this shouldn't work. Remember, we talked about the seal and how it used to be in days of old, and maybe still in a couple of jurisdictions, but in days of old, a promise was legally binding simply by affixing the wax, your wax seal, you know, your, your wax, you, you put your seal on, and so you sign it, you deliver it, signed, sealed, delivered. That's where that comes from, I believe. That's all right, signed, sealed, delivered. You sign it, you seal it, you deliver it. So that alone would make it legally binding, even if there wasn't consideration, even if it wasn't a bargain for exchange. It was a formality and it worked. Well, when the seal went away, basically the way, uh, the formality that made promises legally binding without consideration meant it was the end of formality in general to make a promise legally binding. We've seen exceptions, for example, firm offer rule, but the formality went away. If you allowed court, if you allowed parties to simply go through the motions of a bargain, and but we all knew it was a sham and it was an illusion, wouldn't you basically be permitting court parties to use a formality to create a contract, even though we rejected the idea of a formality as creating a contract? You can't even use blood, it can be signed. Blood doesn't work, the seal doesn't work. Well, why in the world would we allow this to work? This is as much as a formality. It's just a formality. The dollar is a formality. Isn't this just as much a formality as the seal or the blood? Exactly. And so it's not going to work. Now, here's, here is uh, the difficult thing. Telling the difference between a bad deal and a sham bargain. Students struggle mightily with this. Uh, because they, they, they just don't, they feel like those two doctrines are mutually exclusive. How can you have the peppercorn theory and say we don't assess the adequacy of the exchange and at the same time say we are going to be on the lookout for sham bargains? And, and the classic way to find a sham bargain is to see a gross disparity in what's being exchanged. I mean, if the formality is, is, is Bertha Fisher pays him uh, $10,000, well, that doesn't sound like a formality to me. That doesn't sound like a sham to me. It looks like a sham when it's a dollar. And, and the way to do it is, the question is, is it reasonable to believe 
that the person who's getting the short end is simply making a bad deal? Or is it reasonable to believe that they are trying to make this deal, the parties are trying to make this deal legally binding? It's almost like a bad deal. It's like, you know, maybe they were forced into a bad deal for other reasons, or they don't realize it's a bad deal or they don't think it's a bad deal, or it wasn't a bad deal at the time, versus they all know what's up, they all know this is a gift, and they are just trying to make it look like a bargain. And if you can wrap your brain around the difference between those two, you've actually gone a long way toward understanding the bargain for requirement. And that's tough. That really is tough to process because, uh, you know, on the one hand, you know, it's an objective theory, but on another, on the other hand, you're looking kind of into the motivations of the parties objectively, and it's fair. That's confusing. You absolutely are, because when we talked about this, the objective theory is what would a reasonable person believe the parties intended. So, what would a reasonable person believe their motive was? So, it is. It, it's objective, but. It, it's, it's, it's not completely, it's, it's got this sense of, we're trying to figure out what we think, the, it's objective in the sense we're asking what the reasonable person would have thought, but what would the reasonable person have thought the parties intended or their motive was. And another note on bargain for, students need to be very careful that they don't think bargain for means that you need actual back and forth bargaining. Bargain for is a term of art. We see a lot of terms of art, past consideration, the moral obligation doctrine. Bargain for is a term of art. Bargain for means that it's a reasonable person to believe that each party was motivated to make their promise to get what the other was giving, or that they were motivated to perform like a unilateral contract to get what the other side is giving. Bargain for does not require actual negotiations. I'll give you an example, standard form contract. You go in to buy a car, I slide the contract over to you and I say, take it or leave it. I'm not bargaining. And you sign it and I sign it. Well, that's a considered bargain for because a reasonable person would believe you were motivated to promise to pay for the car to get the car. And a reasonable person would believe I was motivated to give you the car to get the purchase price. You're paying me. That satisfies the standard of bargain for. But there was zero, zilch of bargaining. You know, I told you I wouldn't bargain. I won't bargain, but it's still considered bargain for. So just keep in mind that bargain for is a term of art. Unilateral contracts. Students struggle with how unilateral contracts fit within the concept of bargain for exchange. And I get that. I offer $500 for anyone who finds and returns patches the cat. You never talk to me. You don't, we know offers for unilateral contract. The offer is not required to give notice. Prior to acceptance, we talked about carbolic smoke ball. You just show up with patches of cat and you, you deliver patches of cat to me. I may not even be home. You know, you drop patches of cat through my cat door. I come home and I find patches of cat. The minute patches of cat popped into my house, my duty to pay you $500 matured. There was zilch of bargaining. And many of these offers of reward, prize offer, there's no bargaining. You know, but it is still considered a bargain for exchange in that it is reasonable to believe each party was motivated to do what they did to get what the other side was giving. And let me point out something here, which I don't have in the book. I may add next time. I took it out. I really thought I should go back in. I was trying to cut, Steve. I was trying to cut. The book's already too long. long. It's already too long. So is if you perform an act, if you know of an offer of a unilateral contract and you perform the act, there is a presumption that you were a reasonable person would believe you were motivated to do it to get the reward, even uh, even if you know we think there's even if later you say, oh, I wasn't really thinking. I knew about the reward, but I wouldn't really have it in my mind at the time. And we had these guys who went out and they went fishing, and then they, they knew there was a reward for catching. Diamond Jim the third or something like that. It was one of these contests. And you know, he's tagged, the poor fish is tagged. And whoever catches them gets a bunch of money or something. And they're out fishing. And they know about the reward. Now that's important because remember with an offer for a unilateral contract, you cannot accept unless at the point of completing the act, 
you know of the reward, the offer. They knew about it, but that's not why they were going out fishing. They were going to go fishing, and they catch Diamond Jim, and they hand in Diamond Jim. And I think it actually ended up being a tax case because they the issue was for the taxes for the IRS yeah. was they didn't want to report it. They didn't want to pay taxes on it. And the question was, was it a gift? They got the money. And the question was, was it a gift or was it a, were they paid under a contract? And I think, you know, I don't know anything about tax law, but they were arguing that it was, I mean, I, I pay taxes. Okay. All right. I pay taxes. <laughs> right. I swear. Okay. Right. We sure, sure, sure. Do it for me. <laughs> yeah. Wink, I, wink. I do something else, else to do it for it. So I said, so, so there they were arguing, well, it's a gift. And the IRS is like, it's a contract. And so the question was, had it been a contract? And they're like, look, we did not go out looking to catch Diamond Jim. We would, have, we would have gone out anyway. And what the court said was, nah, it doesn't work that way. They're an offer for you not a contract. They weren't being pro-tax. I think they're being pro, you should be able to collect a reward when the guy says, I'm not paying you the reward. Even if after the fact, you say, I would have done it anyway, even without the reward, as long as you knew about it, there is a presumption that you were that you were motivated at least in part to get it and you get the reward and even if you say after the fact you would have acted the same way it doesn't matter and i think the theory is is that we never really know i mean you say now later you wouldn't you would have done the same thing anyway but you know you don't really know i mean you're just kind of looking back on things and i think we're very courts are very troubled by the idea that People might say on the stand that, well, they would have done it anyway. Like there was this couple who taking care, I think, of, you know, the grandmother or something. And, you know, in response to an offer, they took care of her and she dies. They took care of her, she dies. And I think she said, you get the house and they want the house. And on the stand, they were asked, well, you would have taken care of your grandmother anyway, wouldn't you? You'd have in front of the house. Of course, of course we would have. I mean, Who's gonna come up there and say, you know, heck no. And and then <laughs> and, and the defendant was like, well, so they should they shouldn't get the house because they weren't motivated to get the reward, but they didn't know about it. I mean, she said you get the house. Uh, and the court said, nah, it doesn't matter. You get the house that unless you actually at the time you're performing, disclaim, I'm doing this, but I don't want my house. I'm fishing, but I don't want the reward if I catch Diamond Jim, unless you expressly disclaim it at the time at the time you're going to get the reward even if later you admit that you would have acted the same way. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, the last one, oh, this is a doozy, I think, condition of a gratuitous promise. So Sam Williston was a contracts professor at Harvard in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries. He's one of our most famous contracts professors. And Sam Williston was famous for his hypotheticals. And it's been great to be in his class. And Williston, it depends if you're prepared. And Williston's most famous hypothetical was the following. A benevolent man says to a homeless man, if you go across the street and pick out an overcoat at that shop, I will pay for it. They have my tab. I want to put it on my tab. The, the homeless man goes across the street, picks out an overcoat, and the benevolent man runs behind him and says, I revoke my offer. I'm, I'm not paying for this. And the question is, was there a contract? Has the benevolent man breached a contract? Was there consideration for the benevolent man's promise to pay for the overcoat. Now, there seems to be an exchange of sorts. The, the homeless man was required to do something in order to get to have the promise occur. He was required to cross the street and pick out an overcoat. Now, I will tell you right off the bat that merely accepting a gift, promising to accept a gift is not consideration. Because one of the reasons, the main reasons why you have a consideration requirement is to make a promise of a gift, not bind it. Now we know it can be through alternative theories like promissory estoppel, but the general reason why we have a consideration requirement is to make promises of gifts, not legally bind it. And so the fact that you promise to accept a gift, that's not consideration. 
Uh, and so basically going across the street, taking out the overcoat could be construed in some ways, I guess, as you know, promising to accept a gift or accepting a gift, but you know, it's not his yet. It's not been paid for. So it's not actually been a delivered gift. And the, but he did have to do something. He did go across the street and he did pick it out. And the question is, is that consideration for the benevolent man's promise? And if you follow what we've been talking about with the peppercorn theory versus sham, this is going, this issue is going to flow from that issue. Remember, the question is, is it reasonable to believe that the promisor was motivated, at least in part, to make his or her promise to induce the promisee to promise or to do that which they are required to do? If you take that line, that test, and you drop it on top of these facts, I think the answer might become clear. Would a reasonable person believe that the benevolent man was motivated to make his promise to induce the homeless man to go across the street and pick out an overcoat? Now note, you can't ask, would a reasonable person believe that the benevolent man was motivated to induce the guy to accept a gift? Because that's not going to work, because that would make promises of gifts legally binding. You've got to isolate it. You've got to remove the gift part. Would a reasonable person believe that the benevolent man was motivated to make his promise simply to have the man go across the street and pick out an overcoat? Don't keep going and be like, yes, so he could get a gift. Don't do that. Stop right there. Stop that movie. Hard stop right there. That's all it is. Just that. And then like he puts it back and never gets it. So would a reasonable person believe the benevolent man is motivated simply to get the guy to go across the street and pick out an overcoat and then they'll put it back? And the answer surely is no. And so if that's true, it isn't consideration because a reasonable person wouldn't think he's motivated to induce him to do that stuff. And if he doesn't think the reasonable person doesn't think he's motivated to induce him to do that stuff, that stuff isn't consideration. And what we call it, so you say, well, what is that? That's weird. What is that? We call that our condition going across the street, picking out an overcoat, our conditions on a gratuitous promise. It is a promise of a gift, but in order for the person to get the gift, they have to jump through some hoops. I'm not making the promise of the gift to get you to jump through the hoops, but for some reason, you need to jump through the hoops to get the gift. And so that's not consideration. How are you feeling about that? See, that's a hard, that's a, how do you think the students are feeling about that? Just awful, you know, I'm, I, I like, it's such a, I don't know, it, it feels like splitting hairs, but it, it's, I think that the key is probably to step back and ask what, what is happening. As opposed to, because I think we get caught up in the language of the rule on this one. At least that's that's my feeling. Um, yes, you have to. I often, you know, not a lot of times I tell students, you know, don't just trust your intuition. Like your intuition can get you into a lot of trouble unless you've done this for a long time. I'd like to think that maybe my contract intuition is better now than it was when I was in law school, though I will tell you, it's not infrequent where I will like guess. And I, look, if I'm guessing, I tell students, and I've done this long enough that I can be like, you know, okay, I don't know the answer to that. I'll hazard a guess. Cause it's not, you know, you don't want to do that, I guess, with your first year professor. Cause you'd be doing that like every class session. Well, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, I'm guessing. But often it's not unusual that when I hazard a guess, I go back to my office, I research it, and my guess was wrong. And I come back and I say, look, I looked that up and wow, I'm surprised. So I still get surprised. So your, your intuition on these kind of stuff, it's very dangerous to go with your intuition, even when you've done this for a long time, we're talking about legal issues. This is one area, condition of a gratuitous promise, where I think your intuition can actually point you in the right direction. If it smells like a gift, it's probably a, gift, a condition of a gratuitous promise. If it smells like a veal, 
is probably not a condition of a gratuitous promise. Is it? What, did we read a case? I'm, now I'm going back here to 2008. So, so forgive me if I'm misremembering this yeah. case in the old book. There was a case where someone said, if you come down here, I'll give you this. And, and that, was that, was that one of the cases that we read? A classic, Kirksey v. Kirksey, Alabama, 19th, Alabama, mid 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, Kirksey v. Kirksey is a classic. So Kirksey v. Kirksey, this guy, oh, there's so, it's so much good going on in Kirksey. Or bad. So it's been safe to find good. So you find good is good or good, right? So in Kirksey, this guy owns, he has a house and he owns some land and he learns, and keep in mind, this is the mid 19th century. He learns that his brother has died and his brother left a widow. And he writes to the widow and says to her, look, I heard my brother died. You know, would you like to have a place to stay? I've got a place on my land that you can stay and you can have a place to live and to raise the kids. And she says, yes. And he's like, okay, so I promise you this place. And she moves and surely it was arduous. I mean, she's a widow at the mid 19th century. She's moving across the state of Alabama with a bunch of kids. I mean, it sounds rough. And she moves all the way down there. And she arrives and eventually she's kicked out. I think first she's like booted to the shed or something. And then after the shed, she's booted completely. And she sues for breach of contract. And the, the issue was, was there consideration? And what's interesting about it is this is kind of, you know, Williston's hypothetical is all over this. It's, it's not going across the street, of course, it's moving across state. And so the detriment is much more substantial than in Williston's hypo, but it's, it's factually analogous. And the issue was, was it, she was required to come and move to Alabama and set up residence in order to, to get the promise. And the question is, or to get the performance of the promise. And the question is, is that consideration? And the court said, no, the court said that it was not reasonable to believe that he, Kirksey, number one, was motivated to make his promise to her to induce her to move down and move into the house. Now, what you got to remember is the reason why this is tricky is because you got to ask that question just isolating the detrimental reliance and removing it, separating it from, well, he wanted her to do that because he wanted to, her to accept this gift. You can't do that because accepting a gift is not consideration. A promise to accept a gift is not consideration and accepting it isn't consideration. Now, if you actually accept the whole thing, it can become your property, but you gotta, you gotta cut it off. You can't say, well, he's motivated to induce her to move down there because he wants her to move in there because he wants her to accept that gift of a house. You got to just ask in isolation, is he motivated to induce her to move down there and to just move into the house in and of itself, having nothing to do with wanting to give her the, to gift her the house and the place so to stay? Yeah, so like say he had this extra property, this little spot on his property, and he was afraid he didn't like going to check on it because it was on the edge of the property, and he was worried about vandalism or break-ins, burglaries, theft, thievery, that sort of thing. And then he, he makes that bargain. Now we've got some consideration because he was mode, a reasonable person would think that he wanted her there to keep an eye on the place. And that is always, you know, the fight in these kind of cases is that when it's not been specifically stated what the purpose is, it's a little bit easier. It says, look, if you agree to move in and wash the place, I allow you to, 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 I'll allow you to have it. Well, now it's easy, right? I mean, we're, we're not talking about it because that's an easy bargain for exchange. The more interesting ones, of course, are 
when it is not clear whether he is motivated to induce her to come down. And he doesn't make it explicit that his motivation, part of his motivation is not to give her a gift, but part of the, look, and remember, we only need part of it to be bargain motive. So if 90% of it is gift motive, but a reason, a reason person, not actual motive, but a reason person believe a portion, even as little as 10% of his motive is to have someone watching the place, we're talking and we got consideration. But what's interesting is when he never says that explicitly and you got to look at the circumstances and is it reasonable to believe that part of his motive was to get her to do something like to have her do something like that because he's benefiting from her being there and you know now you've got to kind of figure out what, what the reasonable person would think and what students often bring up is the fact i think he said you know there was something in there and it's been a long time since i've taught that case but about like you know, looking after the property or something like there may be some reference to something like that. Or, and so then the fight is on as to, well, would the reasonable person believe that at least part of his motive was other than just a gift motive? Um, and so that's why these are very hard cases. It's not always so easy to know. Take, for example, Williston's hypothetical. You can easily change the facts and make it a bargain. If the guy is homeless and he's in front of a business, and the business owner has a right to be, let's say it's a public bench. The business owner is unhappy because some people are avoiding the store because the guy's sitting there and, and then he says the same thing. That addition of facts might lead a reasonable person to believe that the benevolent man, if he's the shop owner, is motivated, in, at least in part, to induce the guy to leave, right? I mean, to like go over there you know, and, and or, or, you know, maybe he's, you know, maybe he is, you know, uh, you know, he's, 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 you know, there's, he's covered in some blankets on the bench, right? And he's cold. And so he was figures, well, if I can get him a, a coat, he'll, he'll get, he'll get off this bench or something. I don't know. But, you know, you can change the facts around and now it is not, it's a closer call. Um, so, you know, what I always wondered is, you know, well, is he, you know, could you also make the argument that he, 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 he wanted her company, you know, the brothers died, you know, and so, you know, and she's a widower and maybe, a re and maybe that's why she ends up getting kicked out because she doesn't reciprocate. She doesn't like, <laughs> she doesn't like, you know, what, what his motivation is, but maybe a reasonable person would believe that he wants, you know, he wants her there as, as company or something. But, you know, so an example, other examples, where it wouldn't be consideration, very Kirksey-esque. You know, Kirksey or Kirksey is a tough case because the reliance was so substantial. It, was it wasn't it was just going across the street and picking out an overcoat. It was moving across the state with a bunch of kids, uprooting your life. And it sometimes can be hard for students to think that reliance that's that substantial could still just be a condition of a gratuitous promise. But if you think about it, you know, the kind of the classic condition of a gratuitous promise is I've got a gift. I'm a nice guy, but I'm not that nice. I want you to come and get it. I could bring you the gift, but I'd rather you pick it up. So I've got a gift for you. If you come by my house, I'll give it to you. Because I, I look, I, I'm a gift giver, but I don't look, I don't want to drive over to your house. I only gift so much. I'm not only <laughs> going to gift the drive. So so if you think about it, like so let's say I've got tickets to a basketball game. And I say, look, if you come by my office, I'll give you the tickets. Unless the reasonable person believes that I'm really lonely and just want someone to talk to, even for a minute, to like trap you in there and do a conversation. A reasonable person would believe I'm not motivated to offer you the tickets to induce you to come to my office. I just, I want to give you a gift but I only want a gift so far. I'll give you the gift of the tickets, but I'm not going to give you the gift of delivery. You do delivery, you pick them up, I'll give them to you. Um, and so when the, when the promisor wants to give a gift, but is requiring the promisee, the donee to come pick it up, that's a classic. That's not consideration coming to pick it up. It is just a condition of a gratuitous promise. And if you think about it, that kind of fits Kirksey. The land cannot come to her. The land can't move. She's got to come to the land. He presumably wants to gift her the land. 
or gift her the right to stay there. I mean, he, of course, could have gifted her any time by giving her the deed. So it was the promise to let her stay there. But he can't get the land to her. She's got to come to the land. Um, another classic example is I want to give you a gift, but I want to put a limitation on what you do with it or don't do it. I'll give you, I'll knit you, I promise to knit you a sweater if you agree that you're not going to just throw it in the trash. Because, <laughs> like, I don't want to knit. Steve, it takes me a long time to knit a sweater. I don't want to knit a sweater. If you're just, you don't want it, you know, if, you're not, if I'm going to like go by your house and see like the trash and like hanging out of the, the bin, is like that sleeve. No one wants to see their sweater in the garbage. I get it. <laughs> no way. You know, or, you know, or, or, or I promise to knit you a sweater if you agree to, you know, at least wear it at least once a year. Look, I don't think a reasonable person is going to think that that is a prom that I am making my promise to knit you a sweater simply to induce you to wear it once a year. I probably just want to make sure that you are, you're not, it's not I'm not gonna be wasting my time if I give you a gift. Yeah. But these can be very close cases. We will talk when we talk about legal detriment, legal value, and legal benefit. The other part of bargain for or consideration, other than bargain for exchange. We'll talk about the famous case of Hamer versus Sidway. You know, the promise of money if Willie doesn't engage in these, you know, bad actions, smoking, drinking, swearing, gambling, and whether that was a bargain for exchange or was it perhaps just a gift, you want to gift them the money subject to conditions. And so we'll bring that up. So these can be um, very tough cases. Um, at times. Well, I've considered consideration and bargain for exchange. Um, I think that we've covered a lot on this podcast. Yeah. And the irony is that we did it gratuitously. You're right. We didn't, we should have asked for money. We, we, we didn't learn anything from the hypo with you saving me when I was delirious and bloody. We've learned nothing. One of these days, one of these days, one of these days, we're going to charge and then we can retire off of this podcast because 50 views, Steve, times what? A dollar. That's a lot of money between the two of us. That's a peppercorn, I think. <laughs> that's, where you can't, that's what they say. You can't retire on a peppercorn. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed lesson number nine. Lesson number 10, we will continue talking about consideration. And that is it for this episode of KTALK.